complaint theft, workers' rights, and workplace discrimination should not be swept under the rug. The United States cannot have a functional economy where all the gains go to the corporate class while all pain goes to the regular workers. This House believes that the U.S. Department of Labor minimum wage law should apply to prison laborers. We have a few terms we feel we need to define. The first, U.S. Department of Labor minimum wage. According to the United States Department of Labor, the definition federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, effective for individuals that work on or after July 24, 2009. The second definition is prison labor. United States legal has defined prison labor as forced labor done by convicts in the prison. We also have two observations of the prison system. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, they found that the average wave, wage for prison inmates is 93 cents per hour. And in some private prisons, the wage can go as low as 16 cents an hour. The second observation, at this time, inmates are exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, which states that workers should be paid at least the minimum wage. Our first contention, prison is a form of slavery. First, currently in the United States, prisoners legally may not re receive enough compensation for work done while incarcerated. This current state needs reform because it is simply unjust that a human being doing the same amount of work should receive these enormous wage cuts. For example, in California, female prisoners fight for aspires for a maximum of $1 an hour. In preparation for this task, the women receive as little as three weeks of training when normal fighter, fighter, firefighters have three long years of apprenticeship. It is not fair that these people do nothing, doing one of the most dangerous jobs should receive anything less than minimum wage. This House affirms resolution, this House's resolution affirms the statement by Colin F. Thinwick, Director of Center for Employment and Labor Relations Law at the University of Melbourne that we, we would be complacent compliant in compliance with Article 5 of the 1926 Slavery Convention that requires state parties to take all necessary measures to prevent compulsory or forced labor from developing into conditions analogous to slavery. In addition, it is obvious that large American companies are manipulating prisoners by gaining free labor for little to no cost to them. In this way, the middle class is losing opportunity for jobs because companies would rather take advantage of this free labor. In, if prisons were to receive minimum wage, companies would no longer feel the need to use prison labor, and this would give tons of jobs back to the American public. Our second contention, the United States government is not abiding by international policies regarding prison labor. This would incite larger problems associated with foreign affairs. In order to keep, in, intact, keep peace intact across international foreign affairs, it is imperative that we address the United States' hypocritical failure to comply with international policies. Specifically, one focus on prison labors in which, which is the most fundamental protection for workers. Failure to comply increases tension in, in foreign affairs. While, US, while the U.S. has pressured countries like China into upholding foreign policies in regards to prison labor, the U.S. has failed to follow international protocols that we were in charge of enforcing to begin with. According to Dr. King, the United States condemnation of Chinese prison labor exemplifies the way the U.S. has appointed itself as moral police of the global economy. Our resolution would help us keep our number one source of import, which is China. That as of 2007, they contributed $321.5 billion worth of products consumed by Americans. States is infamous for having the highest incarceration rate above all nations worldwide. Let me clarify. The United States holds 5% of the world population while holding 25% of the world's prisoners. And where are all these criminals being held? The American criminal justice system holds more than 2.3 million people in 1,719 state prisons, 102 federal prisons, 901 juvenile correctional facilities, 
3,163 local jails, and 76 Indian country jails, as well as in military prisons, immigration detention facilities, civil commitment centers, and prisons in the U.S. territories. The affirmative team insists we raise prison labor wage to match the federal minimum wage. According to Merriam-Webster, minimum wage is the lowest wage per hour that a worker may be paid, as mandated in this case by federal law. The minimum wage is a legally mandated price floor on hourly wages which non-exempt workers may not be offered or accept a job. With this being said, to insist that all federal and state facilities adhere to minimum wage policies associating with prisoners' labor is unrealistic, unattainable, and too lofty of a demand. The damages of passing this policy are far greater than any good the affirmative thinks will come. This House opposes that U.S. Department of Labor minimum wage law should apply to prison labor. Let's take a step back. Prison labor works in two ways. There are federally funded prison jobs that we are familiar with, such as serving food, cleaning bathrooms, and other jobs to keep the prison going in general, called TI jobs. Then we have the U.S. Department of Justice's Prison Industry Enhancement Certification Program, more commonly known as PI. PI was created by Congress in 1979 to encourage states and units of local government to establish employment opportunities for inmates that approximate private sector work opportunities. In other words, outside companies partner with PI in order to engage prisoners in labor in exchange for work experience, meeting local minimum wage requirements where parts of wages will be garnished toward inmates room and board, federal taxes, child support, but also victim crime funds. In Texas alone, furniture, graphics, park equipment companies have all partnered up with PI to provide inmates with correctional jobs. The offenders are paid by the private company and deductions are taken from their wages for the offenders taxes, room and board, dependent support, restitution, and a contribution is made to a crime victim's fund. By broadly enforcing minimum wage requirements over federal labor, we forget that this includes programs such as PI. By increasing the rates far higher than what they already are, which low rates are benefits that attract private employers, providers will have no choice but to back out and hire employees not in prisons, even outsourcing, causing this program to collapse along with the economy. Furthermore, why do we have federal prison jobs anyway? A formal federal prison employee states, they get access to canteen items in exchange for money earned in prison. But all of this is about managing motivation and, and time. The wage offered prisoners is intended to be just enough to keep them out of trouble. We pay the minimum amount necessary to get prisoners to do work, which would otherwise cost society more to be done by non-prisoners. This being said, to guarantee minimum wage is to expect elevated costs to the taxpayer and large-scale cutbacks in inmate labor. The problems associated with large-scale cutbacks in inmate labor includes increases in idle time, violence, and misconduct. Also, recidivism rates will increase, prison quality will diminish, and prison staff will be cut off. Work release will be cut. Communities will suffer. The environment will suffer. These repercussions carry with them obvious expenses and dangers. Now, people of the court, with keeping these factors in mind, we urge you to think twice about passing the policy to apply the U.S. Department of Labor's minimum wage laws for non-incarcerated, tax-accumulating labor to prisoners' labor's jobs. The country's future is in your hands. I would like to go ahead and open my argument off with a quote from Julianne Mulvo in her article, Prison Justice and Education. It says, the privatization of the prison system has created employment opportunities for thousands of the incarcerated whose immobile labor is, immobile labor is boosting the profit positions of publicly traded or for-profit corporations. The opposing side argument, in fact, proves our argument. In fact, that they were talking about 
um, how many publicly, how many public companies, private companies, pay these prisoners. If we were to raise the minimum wage, do you realize how many jobs we could have for the American public versus prisoners? Right now, all of their money is going toward these prisoners. So they are just getting richer and richer and richer. Objection. Yes. Are you aware of where the funding actually goes? Where it goes whenever there is a wage and they are cut from the wage? Are you aware of where the rest of the money goes? Uh, you're stating that it goes to the private employers, but in reality, do you know where the rest of it goes? From these companies? From the wages that are earned by the prisoners from these private companies, such as from PI organizations, correct? Right. Are you aware of where the rest of the money goes? Yeah, you just said in this video that you just explained it, unless that was incorrect. Where I'm goes. asking, we didn't say it in our, in our video. Where does the rest you of the money You just said it went to room and board and all sorts of different things. But you just said that it goes into the pockets of the private employers. That it goes. You said all the money goes into the private employers. It goes into prisons. It goes into it's part of part of the prisoners' pockets, right? The rest goes into these these private prisons because for room and board, those sorts of things. Where's your evidence for that? Because that is you just true. said that. No, that is not true. It goes to victims. It does go to that. Does not go the the prison is not the private employers though. They're two different things. There's they a are. private employer that they are funding the. The prisons, it's a partnership. They are not directly from the federal government. These are outside sources. Right, there's public and private. I get that, right? Is that what you're trying to get at? No, I'm saying that there, the system, the federal system, is partnered with private companies. Yes. Then the money that is earned from the work that's done by the private, it does not go directly to the private organization and their pockets and the prison. There's also many different where, places that it goes. The amount of money that goes into the, the so they, private organizations this is, is not a really large long time. wage. I'd like to continue, yeah. please. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so like I was saying, if I can remember, um, the public, these prisoners that, <laughs> that was a really long time, these prisoners that um, are receiving um, part of these uh, money don't get enough. And if they were to get more, the money would go to more Americans that would get like middle class jobs. Um, we're taking a money away from the American public, we're taking money away from um, our civilization, our society, it's not fair. Um, we also said that these, this past speech said that these goals were unrealistic and unattainable, and I just want to point out that that's not true. I think 90 cents, 93 cents an hour as an average for prisoner labor is just unjust, and like Bree said, I, it's slavery, it's not even fair. In fact, many of them are forced labor, like we described in our um, our uh, descriptions at the beginning. Um, prison labor is forced labor, which means no money. Um, one of the things y'all mentioned was the environment, and there is no explanation on that, so I would like some clarification on that. We don't see any negative environmental factors from simply raising minimum wage. It's just an economic issue. And in fact, if you just look at economics, um, I think that would be a little insensitive because of how many prisoners um, are going without wages and are, that have families. Um, they are literally working for nothing. Um, they have no name for themselves once they get out of prison and it's not fair. Um, their families just don't have a way to come back from that either. And many of these children will end up in foster homes as well. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. exactly in his video about the environment, but the prisoners participate in traditional industry programs which are led by the prison and they go out into our environment and they do get paid minimally for those, not what y'all want it to be, but they do get paid and it does 
actually support their families because within the PIVE program specifically, their stuff actually ends up, a percentage of it gets tucked away for the families for when they get out of jail. Um, Additionally, the PI program requires a percentage of wages to be saved. This is to assist the inmate when he is released. Upon release, the inmate's wages will make their way back into the economy. So overall, it ends up helping the economy. Okay, can you give me a percentage of how much of that money goes to the to them and when they get out of prison and to the victims when they get out when and like their probation and like well when they get out of prison just. How much of that money goes to each part? I mean, it differs depending on the prisoner that is, like, the amount of time that they're in there, it depends on each prisoner. You can't give us a rough, rough estimate of how much they get? Like how much they get? Because you can say a percent of percentage could be one to five percent, and that would be nothing, because they can't really survive off of that with families that have more than three children. ask you a question and you can just keep going. I mean, yeah. Okay. So, from the study by the National Institute of Justice, research was done to determine the long-term positive effects of prison work programs, specifically PI. Um, first, I'll start out with uh, the job stability data of PI. And it says that PI's program, it ends up actually helping prisoners once they get out. If they participate in those programs, they are um, eventually going to be able to partner in like transition programs um, and 60 percent of them end up actually finding jobs and um, typically get paid like around ten dollars um, and it says that high participants found jobs more quickly and held them longer than um, traditional industries which are the ones that are talking about uh, the pie pie ones and then it says that through them being in PI, there actually is a higher rate of them not being, uh, going back to prison, and they're arrest free 77% uh, of the time, and 82% of the time for TI. Um, after three years, 60% of the PI participants were arrest free, and the other two groups had 52% arrest free rates, and that's found in the National Institute of Justice. And 93% of PI participants remained incarceration free during the study's follow up periods compared with 89% of TI and OTW participants. They also are learning skills called soft skills, which helps them become a functional member of society once they're um, done in their prison time. And those are things like uh, timeliness, respecting authority figures, comprehension of directions and the value of teamwork, and taking pride in one's accomplishment. And general technical skills are that the data tells us that less than 5% of the total inmate population work in PI roles. So those are pretty significant. And it says that the obvious benefit to PI is the increased pay and bonus opportunities. So PI actually meets minimum wage. And those programs have to meet minimum wage. Um, for example, PI programs in Colorado can bring up to $400 per month. That's a large sum considering that average hourly pay is around 25 cents around the nation. So they have to be paid the prevailing wage for their work. And since these jobs already meet minimum wage, the wage is distributed, and up to 80% of inmates' earnings can be garnished toward room and board, victim restitution, child support, and mandatory savings, the same way our earnings still get cut for taxes. start off by saying that um, we're not against anything you're saying regarding the PIE program, but it's to pay them more. That's really all it is. We're giving jobs to the American public, 
Um, Trump's tax cut is about to get passed very soon as well. So um, those are two very crucial points. And back to your opening statement, um, saying minimum wage is too lofty of a demand for prison workers. Is it too lofty for someone to put their life on the line for like one cent an hour? Um, according to um, in the line of fire, which is a New York Times Magazine article, um, California's inmate firefighters used to take part in the grinding and dangerous work that they do, and they get paid for it, though not much. They have to pass a fitness test where they can qualify for fire camps. But once they are accepted into camp, the training they receive, which often lasts as little as three weeks, is significantly less than a three-year apprenticeship that full-time civilian firefighters get. I think that is very unfair and very unjust, which goes back to the slavery statement. Um, would it also be too lofty if it was your significant other or your kin who was in prison for um, whatever they committed? Um, you mentioned that they do um, TI jobs, such as cleaning the restroom, cooking food, and et cetera, but you failed to mention the jobs such as, as, such as fighting fires, um, which can also like cause danger dangerous harms to their, to their body. Um, David Fati, the director of ACLU Natural Prison Project, um, who opposes all forms of prison labor, told this person that typed this article, I think one important question to ask is if these people are safe to be out and about carrying axes and chainsaws, maybe they didn't need to be in prison in the first place. Do you agree? Um, back to um, one of our contentions. Um, Okay, the U.S. government is not abiding by international policies regarding prison labor. This could incite larger problems than associated with foreign affairs. And in order to keep the peace um, intact across international foreign affairs, it is imperative that we address the United States' critical failure to, failure to comply with international policies, um, specifically one focused on prison labor rights, which is the fundamental protections um, for workers. Failure to comply increases tensions in foreign affairs. Uh, while the U.S. has pressured countries like China into upholding foreign policies in regards to prison labor, the U.S. failed to follow um, international protocols that we enforced to begin with. Um, according to Dr. King, the United States' um, con condemnation of Chinese prison labor exemplifies the way the U.S. has appointed itself into moral policemen um, of global economy. Um, I believe it is ethically immoral and ethically incorrect. Yes, people have committed crime, but it's to sit there and keep them like slaves. Everything that we have um, built upon the station to not be a part of and to grow from and to get past, I feel like it's very ethically unjust and ethically immoral. start by saying that I understand where you might believe that the work that's being done in the prisons is slavery, but in reality, um, prisoners receive in their uh, uh, time in prison all the rights that um, a human would need to survive. Once they are incarcerated, their rights are stripped of them. That is in our Constitution. And once slavery was abolished in the 13th Amendment, that did not come that did not cover, um, that does not, uh, in the Atlantic, it states, I, I want to finish this first, actually, incarcerated workers are not express, expressly excluded from the definition of employees and workers. Protection statutes like the Fair Labor Standards of Act or the National Labor Reac Relations. However, in the cases where incarcerated workers have sued their prison employees, uh, they are, uh, the courts have ruled that the relationship between the penitentiary and the inmates twice by two separate judges is not slavery. So this is not the first time that this case has ever been brought up twice before and appealed twice by two different judges. They have said this is not this does not constitute as slavery, both going back to Abraham Lincoln's times for the 13th Amendment 
say, stating in section one that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except for punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Therefore, this isn't going to uh, fall under slavery. Now, also by stating that um, the firefighters, right? The firefighters, so there's lots of jobs that require, you know, uh, uh, that might not have the safest work environments, right? But that, that's to say that anybody outside of prisons as well, there is no price to life. But as mentioned earlier, they have But with that being said, to, let me finish, please, finish, please, please let me finish. With that being said, these people who are in those specific programs are in work release programs. Yeah, they're not making the most, but that gets time cut off of their sentencing. Anyway, moving on. Um, my partner went ahead and she was speaking about PI and about what they benefit from it. But what we're not understanding is the chronological effect of what's going to happen for the effect, right? The effect of what happens if this comes into place. All the benefits that she stated. Are you a stated, how it might affect for I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be answering that yet. It's right relevant now. to the subject. And all so I think of that. Think about it. But that, that being said, as my teammate stated, that's the effects. I'm going to be going into the effects of what's going to happen after, right? So theoretically, if it goes through, how is it going to happen? Let's be realistic. We're running out of um, these these labor programs are 88 percent of all in 88 percent of all prisons that were stated in the video before. 88 percent of those have labor. Now that being said, there's going to be a minimum of 350 percent increase in the wages, being that they said the, the minimum wage is, uh, the average is for the, um, for the prices. But what happens is um, all of these programs are going to be cut. They have to make these cuts somewhere. In a beautiful world where we get to keep all these programs and the wages go up would be great, but that's just not how it works. Why not? That's not how it works. Where are we going to be pulling the money from? without having to have extreme tax increases to keep with the system the way it is, just to increase the minimum wage. Realistically, re, uh, recreational yeah, yeah. recreational um, activities will be cut. All of the positive things that she said that comes from these programs cut, the re-entering of prisons will be, the, the rates will go through the roof. Um, the work for, work, work release, is going to be cut and then once you do have the TI programs whereas you had 20 servers in a in a cafeteria you're going to be uh, limited to five and then what's going to be happening violence is going to increase the idle time in the prisons are going to increase therefore they're going to be um, decreasing in the levels and when it comes to the labor in these um, programs they benefit our economy because you're they are taking the the materials and then they are uh, outputting are materials breaking international and law then now? with that being said yes but again that's so not okay, breaking international law <laughs> no that's we not at all law. we created foreign law affairs. for us to have foreign affairs and we told them that they cannot do this prison like we can't have prisoners working for low wages but we are now doing it we are breaking the law that but what happens have. whenever you cut these out is that these are all going to be outsourced every single job that's in these prisons that you think is going to be outsourced the current it's system time. isn't breaking it in at all. It's time. I'm sorry. It's time. Okay, guys, hold it to a question. You need to acknowledge when a hand is up and hold it to a question. We can't debate back and forth between everyone at the table, okay? okay. All right, next, please. While our opponents constructed a somewhat relevant argument in regards to why prisoners shouldn't receive a minimum wage, they failed to offer a concrete argument. Um, our rebuttals argue their lack of cons considering moral values or socioeconomic factors. Um, while our, our opponents argued Pi wanted to establish employment through outside companies, they simply argued that it was unrealistic. However, justice is not unrealistic. And they failed to argue about the importance of maintaining a justice system, which respects the authority that they, they themselves uphold. Uh, like in the case with the United States and China, um, they collectively, uh, the leading countries, created an organization so that they could, so that they could uphold uh, human rights issues. And so they, they are forcing China to uphold this policy that not even the United States is upholding, which could tarnish foreign affairs. 
They argued about how the government distributes funding and how it is benef actually beneficial to the way our system functions. However, there was not enough content su to support that they are making a productive difference in our society. Um, as I conclude my speech, I would like to reflect on the importance of addressing a couple of issues. Prison labor as a new form of slavery, in which I quote, California's inmate firefighters choose to take part in the grinding and dangerous work they do, and they get paid for it. Though not much, they have to pass a fitness test before they can qualify for fire camps. Now this is actually a pretty um, nice way of putting it, because the conditions that they work under are extremely harsh. Uh, typically, firefighters have to train uh, typically, firefighters have to train um, a little bit more than two weeks to, to, to start working in the field. And then, we also argue that the United States is acting in opposition of human rights, the, a human rights treaty among other leading countries and how that could increase tension in foreign affairs. If we, tar if we tarnish foreign affairs, we could find ourselves in an even, or in even larger issues with other leading countries which could lead to war. So that would lead to an even larger uh, socio and economic impact. Um, although you are so focused on the economic factor, you should more, impo more importantly focus on justice in our society. Um, and that's our close. striving for fairness and equality and in a perfect world, yes, giving prisoners minimum wage seems fair. However, it's a small factor in play. With applying minimum wage to prisoners, um, it will cause cuts or complete loss to beneficial programs within the prison system like PI or TI, um, which in turn will increase idle time, violence, and misconduct. And I think those are things or factors that we are forgetting. Prison labor provides a way to pay society back for the cost of incarceration as well as a pathway to correct deviant behavior and possibly find personal redemption. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist. This is taken straight from the 13th Amendment in the Constitution. It's, it, it's in the Constitution. Slavery is not what is happening here. They are simply paying or playing out their punishment. Um, all those, these jobs we'd be taking away from the opportunities um, from citizens not imprisoned, you have to look at the bigger picture. Take away their jobs and you hinder them success once released. Prison work and training programs seem to have been especially effective in reducing the likelihood of recidivism in the long term, in the long term. So these outside jobs can teach inmates not just technical skills, but soft skills as well. Many vendors have never worked a legal job and need to learn the basics of show, uh, like showing up on time, listening to a supervisor, and working as part of a team, and according, according to Gina Honeycutt, Executive Director of the National Correctional Industries Association. Companies that contract must pay, must pay minimum wage already. Prisoners simply have wages garnished for room and board, like we already said. So federal law requires contractors to pay minimum wage for inmate work. The labor isn't cheap. Um, it's a state that must garnish these wages to cover the cost of incarceration. Um, economists note soberly that prison labor offers a unique opportunity to offset the enormous cost of the prison system that has spiraled into the stratosphere of a state spending over $50 billion a year to house already. So imagine giving them minimum wage, how much that's going to offset the cost. It's not, like we said, it's not attainable. It's not, it's not practical in the sense the system that we have at hand is it is the way it is because it works it helped 
in, we all have the same goal. We want to give them minimum wage. We would. I think we, it's safe to say that we would want to give these people minimum wage because it is fair and it is equality, but in the end, it doesn't make sense. We are, federal law requires that we give them minimum wage, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We're giving them them, but it's cut with, for the room and board.